here to speak about my brother. He was my world, and we've been together from before we were born, so that was a very long time. We were already connected at that point. And I just have to thank everybody for the kind words, the cards, prayers, and support that you've given the family through this difficult time. But now I'm going to give you a side of Neil that I knew. My brother. This was us celebrating our first Easter with my mother and father, Neil and Gloria Comprado. We did everything at home, including riding his horse together, which he eventually broke because he rode like this, like a maniac. <laughs> we had our own little dinner table when we were small, so that, that was where we would eat. And this was Easter Mass. In fact, my mother saved everything. I still have that outfit. Of <laughs> They looked checkered off when we were two years old. This, we were, I always said, locked in our backyard. We were fenced in till kindergarten. So we <laughs> had great supervision by parents until school started. This was our first picture once we started kindergarten. And I still have those sweaters also. This was Neil in elementary school, starting to develop into a young man. And Neil played football from junior high through Allegheny College. He this was at Allegheny College with my father. And he just was such a good player, um, not a great player, but a determined player that Sam Timer, who was his coach at Allegheny College, went on to coach at the New England Patriots. And when he retired, he said, he was asked, who was the greatest player that you ever remember coaching? Was it Doug Flutie? And Sam Timer said, no, actually, it was a guy named Neil Capretto. This was being honored into the uh, Kiski Area Hall of Fame, Sports Hall of Fame, his football team. They were undefeated from the time they played together from junior high until their very last game as seniors. Never lost a game until the last game. That was the only defeat they experienced. And then Neil's wife, Amy, which I'm sure many of you that knew him have met her, they were married on Maui in 2005. This year would have been 13 year anniversary. It was his love of his life. And that's another picture of them also. Neil had two sons, Andrew and Peter. Andrew is a teacher at Thomas Jefferson. He teaches gifted students and Peter he is on his doctorate at Vanderbilt in Nashville and uh, will probably end up teaching at, at a college level. Both, both brilliant young men. This was our 50th celebration. Our Capretta twins turned 50. It was quite the party. And this was just a few weeks before Neil passed away when he was finishing his total brain radiation. And I was there with two of my cousins and Neil's son, Peter. And he was still in good spirits then. This was a joyous occasion when Neil, his son Andrew, they had the first grandchild, Aliana. I think that's it. That's it with pictures, because I was not good at sending pictures. But now, to get to Neil, you know, some of the stories I want to share with you. Starting from birth, my mother was told she was having one child. 
she kept gaining weight and said, I think I'm having twins. And the doctor said, no, there's one heartbeat, one child. And she was to have the baby in September. But on August 18th, she went into delivery and he delivered me a five pound baby girl and left. And as the doctors were cleaning up, they saw a foot. <laughs> they had to go track the, the physician down, call him back in, and we were 29 minutes apart. Neil came out feet first, and she just yelled at the doctor saying, I told you there were two. <laughs> so that's how his life started. And for our 60th birthday, because it was so hard to buy something for him, my father had saved all his English compositions. So I had this booklet made up, which I think I'm going to send one the gateway to keep in their library. It was from his compositions from 1968 through 1977. And one of the stories he wrote about was called Pre-Life. It related to his struggles in the world, but in the womb. And the first sentence was, get your feet out of my face. Which he did not have a sense of smell, so I often wonder if that was why. But we'll never know for sure. <laughs> Through school, in elementary school, Neil, he, his desk was usually up next to the teacher. They didn't have gifted students back then, so I think he was just basically bored and devilish. But once he started junior high, through high school and college, every award there was to receive, my brother received. He was just so driven. But not just with studies, he loved his sports. Like I say, he played football and he ran track, both in high school and college, and when they weren't playing, him and his friends, Sam, Danny, and Mike from childhood, would be playing football in the park. So it was always sports, 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 and when it came time to go to a movie, he would call a girl two minutes, two hours before, asking her if she wanted to go on a date. I would say, you know, women like more time than that, but yeah, they, he never had a problem getting a date, though, that was for sure. And uh, one of the funny stories with track, a lot of his coaches, they came to visit him in the hospital. And the one I had said, you know, with what you did, what you put these boys through when they were young, in today's standards, you would be thrown in jail. Because it was just brutal, the stories. But they laughed about it. And the teacher said, yeah, that's when I decided to retire. And um, we had a good laugh about that. And his track teacher, he had developed this, read about this theory about running faster, get your, your people to run faster. So he had a truck and he had ropes tied around Neil's arms and legs. And as he drove the truck, around the track, it was to help Neil keep moving. <laughs> Except the ropes got tangled, and so he did, <laughs> he just rolled head over heels around till they finally stopped. And yeah, I heard that story years later, but I mean, today I'm sure something like that would have made the news, but back then, that was just part of training <laughs> in sports in Vanderbilt. Then once Neil went into medical school, he didn't know what he wanted to be, general practice. But when he went into psychiatry, he loved it. He just, he was a good listener, he was compassionate, and even at that level, he was helping many people, people that others couldn't reach, like a young man who had tried to commit suicide, he was special needs, and he had peed his pants before getting into a porta john And no one could reach him. And Neil, being the doctor on call, 
spoke with him and shared a story about his childhood friend who was in an Ivy League school who had was at a game and couldn't hold it and ended up going in his white slacks and had to leave the game, leaving his blind date alone to the seventh inning when he got back. And he told this kid, he was an Ivy League student, and the, and the boy looked up and said, really? That makes me feel better. And <laughs> so he was able to reach him just through everyday occurrence with his life. Another um, thing was then his, his sons. He, his sons were both um, so really taking this hard. And Peter, who's working on his doctorate in um, Nashville, wrote a beautiful eulogy about Neil and on Facebook. And I copied just a, a couple of paragraphs I want to read of how he acknowledged his dad. He said, his kindness knew no bounds at home and in friendship. Even when close to death, my dad was caring for the medical staff treating him, bringing them to tears more than a few times. One true gift of being with my father through his illness was to witness the outpouring of love and stories from people he helped. But perhaps my greatest moment of melancholy in mourning his death are those men thinking about how many more lives he would have dignified and saved. It's not an exaggeration to say my father did more good for others in a typical month than most do in a lifetime. So losing him to an obscure and incurable cancer at age 62 hurts a lot. And that was so true. My final words with him when he was in hospice, we would take turns spending the night and our nights together were always the best. He had the best sleep, the best comfort. And we, we talked seriously about things. We also laughed about our childhood. He wanted funny stories like how we would roll down coal piles and come home totally black and couldn't understand why my mother would laugh at us. We just had such good times. But I said to, he said to me, Audrey, he says, I've become so close to God. He's surrounding me. He says, I'm at peace. And I said to him, Neil, I don't know how I'm going to go on without you. We've been together all our life and before that, you know. And he said, don't worry, Audrey. He says, I'll always be with you. He says, I'll always watch over you. And I said to him, you know, Neil, God, people say God has a plan. And I said, the only thing I can think of is, that he needs you on the other side. He needs you because you're going to be a life force. You'll be able to be everywhere. With the opioid problem being so bad, you can help so many at once find strength to overcome. And then I said to him, I would like some kind of you know, come back to me and give me some kind of um, sign that you're going to be okay. And so he thought for a minute, we did like to play golf a lot, and he said, I know, when the Masters is on, your screen will get real bright, and you'll know I'm okay. But I said, Neil, Masters isn't on until next spring. I don't want to <laughs> wait that long. And we had another good laugh. We really laughed to the end. He was just, he was such a gracious person and just was there for everybody. You know, he always gave 110% and, um, and I believe that he still 
still working, but over on the other side. And um, that's how I'd like to remember it. And I hope you always keep him in your hearts. And hopefully someday we'll get a control on this terrible, terrible uh, disease. So thank you for letting me speak today. I appreciate it.